You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. longest running showcase of modern audio drama. I'm here with Mr. David Alt, of course, with another packed show. Yes, hello Jack, and welcome everyone. This week our feature is Confessions of a New Grad. When Brooklyn Winters graduates from universities, she thinks that her adult life will just kind of figure itself out. Spoiler alert, this doesn't happen. Six weeks after graduation, she has no job, no money, and is frantically calling her best friend to come and rescue her from the basement suite she has unwisely moved into with her dud of a boyfriend. Created by Greta Craig, our Canadian Podcast Awards nominee double feature begins with chapters one and two, Graduation and the Basement, all right here on the Sonic Society. You're listening to Confessions of a New Grad. Chapter 1. Graduation. You have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. The Dr. Seuss quote flashed across the large golden auditorium as graduate after graduate stepped up on stage to receive their diplomas. What if you don't know which direction to choose, though? I asked my best friend, Gemma, as the monitor replaced Dr. Seuss's quote with another inspirational saying. Gemma's one letter ahead of me in the alphabet, so we had the luxury of standing in line together. No idea, Gemma sighed as Austin Larson posed up on stage with his diploma, his frat bros cheering and whistling. Brooklyn Winters! An annoyed, administrative-looking woman tapped me on the shoulder. Yes, I said. We're so sorry, she said, not looking sorry at all. But there seems to have been a bit of a glitch. What? I asked, giving Gemma a quizzical look. There's been a glitch, the woman muttered, looking nervously around to make sure that no one in the crowd of applauding friends and family members had heard her. What does that mean? I demanded. Well, don't worry, it looks like you still have all the requirements to graduate. I know I do. I double-checked like a million times, and you guys made me take another second language course this year because you changed the requirements halfway through my degree. Yes, well, anyway, it looks like you have all the requirements, but something went wrong when you submitted your graduation application online. What went wrong? It was just a small glitch on our end. It's not a big deal. It just means that you won't be on the list of graduates in the graduation ceremony program. But the good news is that we think we may have caught the glitch in time to add you to the official photo and list of graduates for this year. I can't 100% guarantee it, but it should be all right. So you're telling me that when I tell future employers that I went to UBC and they fact check me, I might not be on record? Oh, well, I wouldn't worry about that. No one actually calls the university to check if you really attended, the woman said dismissively. Employers uh, usually take your word for it. Huh, Gemma said. Kinda makes you wonder why we spent all this time and money here then. The woman ignored her and handed me a piece of standard printing paper as the crowd cheered, in a somewhat lackluster fashion, for Lauren Orwell. People always lose steam as it gets toward the end of the alphabet. What's this? I asked the woman. 
Well, we weren't able to print out your diploma, she said. So I need you to write your full name and degree on here so that the head of faculty knows what to announce to the audience. I don't get a diploma, I asked. Keep your voice down, the woman hissed. And yes, of course, you'll get a diploma. This is just for the ceremony. Now, please, write down your info. I have a lot to do today. Sorry to inconvenience you, I said, taking her pen and trying to write out my information against my hand. The paper ripped. The woman exasperatedly gave me another piece and her clipboard. I wrote my name, Bachelor of Arts in English Literature, and Bachelor of Education on the paper. Thank you, the woman said. Now, after you shake hands with the head of faculty, he will give you two diplomas. They'll be empty inside, of course, but you can still hold up the outside of them for your photo. The university will mail you your real diplomas in a few weeks. Now, go enjoy your graduation day and don't worry about your diploma. It's only a piece of paper anyway. She shuffled off down the line, presumably to tell another student that they had been affected by the glitch. You'd think that she, of all people, wouldn't go around informing us that we'd just wasted years of our lives on a pointless paper chase, Gemma said, thoughtfully, taking a huge swig from a coffee mug that she was holding. You'd think, I said, readjusting my cap. Cheer up she said, passing me her coffee mug. We did it. I smiled and then gagged as I took a sip of her coffee. What is this? Whiskey, she admitted. Dude, it's 11 a.m. And since when do you drink whiskey? Since I'm graduating with a visual arts degree and have no idea what the fuck I'm going to do with my life, she lamented. Fair, I said, taking a large swig and grimacing. We are so screwed, Gemma said. We laughed at the irresponsibility of our past selves, at our situation, at the fact that this hard-earned moment was not remotely as sweet or climactic as we had thought it would be. I wondered what was wrong with me as I watched student after student get their diploma and shake hands with the dean. I should be proud that I was graduating from university and grateful that I had parents who had been supportive and financially stable enough to help me pay for it. I should be relieved that I had decided to go back for an extra year and get a teaching degree so that I would actually be employable after graduation. So why had the speech that the valedictorian had made about this being an exciting new beginning fallen so flat? Was it because I knew that all the friends and fun I'd had over the past five years were about to disintegrate into early mornings and late nights at a stressful job I was going to hate if I was one of the lucky ones to even get a job? Gemma Wilding, the head of faculty called, and Gemma walked up the short flight of steps onto the stage. She had wisely chosen to wear flats and showed no signs of the wobbliness that I did. Her thick brown mane of tight ringlets was pulled effortlessly back from her face. She looked beautiful until she stepped into the middle of the stage for her photo, crumpled her face into her neck to create several double chins, and stuck out her tongue. A loud ha sounded from the crowd. I looked out to see my two brothers and Gemma's one laughing appreciatively. Gemma's mother had her face in her hands in dismay, and her father was trying to fix a problem with his camera. My parents were seated in the row behind them. My dad was the definition of prepared with a long-lensed professional camera. He gave Gemma's father a thumbs up 
to reassure him that he'd gotten a shot of Gemma and would send it to him. My mom was seated next to my dad, crying tears of joy into her shawl. She looked very pretty and waved at me, mouthing, I love you, as Gemma shook hands with the dean. I smiled back at her, holding back a sudden desire to cry. I knew this day wasn't easy for her. My dad and her had broken up a year ago, and this was the first time they'd seen each other since then. It was weird seeing them seated next to my brothers now, like the family they no longer were. A bored-looking woman pushed me along the line, and I handed the piece of paper with my name and degree on it to the head of faculty. He was dressed in what I can only describe as wizarding robes and beamed at me. Broke, I mean, Brooklyn Winters, he said, giving me an apologetic look. I smiled at him. I wasn't offended that he had mixed up my first name with my new financial status. It wasn't his fault that UBC had over 50,000 students and he had no idea who I was. He handed me the two empty diplomas that I had spent five years chasing, and I walked across the stage, trying to make the smile on my face look and feel genuine as I stepped out onto the blinding spotlight, knowing I had less than three seconds to look good for the picture my dad was taking from the crowd. The dean shook my hand, and we made eye contact for the first and last time in my university career. Then I followed Gemma down the aisle and out of the auditorium. I had made it. I was finally done. This was what all those sleepless nights and pointless papers were for. This was supposed to be that moment where everything fell together. So why did my diploma cases, which to all intents and purposes looked the same as the one that held Gemma's with their embossed blue and gold UBC seal feel so flimsy in my slightly sweaty hands. Pushing those thoughts aside, I stepped outside with Gemma into the sunny rose garden. Because my teaching degree had been 12 months, and Gemma had needed to take an extra online course to graduate, it was the end of summer, and the rose garden was in full bloom. It was perched on the edge of campus, overlooking the sapphire blue Pacific Ocean and fir tree clad North Shore Mountains. It was a gorgeous place, and I had run down the winding road, past the Rose Garden, and down to Spanish Banks Beach below countless times in my five years here. The music inside the Chan Center stopped as the ceremony ended and friends and family members made their way outside to congratulate the graduates in the garden and take photos. A tanned, stocky guy with windswept black hair rushed over and smothered me in a hug. This was my boyfriend, Tyler, and I should have been happy to see him. I'm glad I found you. I couldn't get a seat with your family, so I had to stand at the back. He handed me a pale pink bouquet of flowers and a card. Thanks, Ty, I said. What do you think of the card? He asked eagerly. It looked like... One of those grotesquely exaggerated portraits tourists can pay for on the streets of some city or other, except that it wasn't as good. It depicted a blonde girl wearing a graduation cap and a rather stale smile. I assumed the girl was supposed to be me and couldn't help feeling a little offended by the beakiness of her nose. Her eyes were a dull, blackish gray, which made me wonder if Tyler had ever even noticed that mine were actually green, and her hair was a shocking platinum blonde. My real hair is more of a copper and cherry blend of auburn. The summer 
had left me with a few bright streaks of gold, but nothing close to the highlighter yellow color that Tyler had used. Maybe his version was aspirational. Good, isn't it? Tyler boasted, waving the picture in my dad's face as my family came over to join us. Can you believe I've never had any formal art training? Shocking, my dad muttered, sarcastically, his eyes narrowing at the sight of the girl's double Ds, which were the focal point of the picture. In fairness to Tyler, this was probably the most accurate part of his drawing, but it was a little disconcerting that this was the only part of me he'd bothered to get right. Let's get a picture, Tyler cried, oblivious to the death stares my brothers were now giving him and pulling me toward a picturesque spot in front of some blushing rose bushes. My dad hurriedly snapped a photo or two and then asked Tyler if he could take some of just the family. Tyler obliged, and I stood in between my dad on one side and my brothers and mum on the other. I tried to ignore the way my mum kept looking at my dad and the way he kept pretending not to see her doing it. Let's go get cake, Brooklyn, Gemma called, rushing over after taking pictures with her own family. I eagerly agreed, and we made our way over to the table in the center of the rose garden that held the refreshments. But all that we found when we got there were several delicious-looking crumbs and some icing. Should have come earlier, a random middle-aged guy with a mouthful of cake said. He had a plate with two enormous pieces on it. Isn't there any more? Gemma asked, looking crestfallen. Nope, they said I got the last two pieces, the man laughed triumphantly. Who are you? I asked. Oh, um, my niece, once removed, is graduating today, he said, gesturing vaguely at a large group of people surrounding a brunette girl posing for photos. Any chance you want to give us those two pieces you have there? Gemma asked. Ha! No way! It's way too good! But, Gemma began, first come, first serve, the man shouted over her, and disappeared into the crowd. How pathetic would it be if I licked the plate, Gemma whispered. I opened my mouth to answer, but was interrupted by a hand wrapping around my waist. I recoiled, thinking it would be Tyler, but as I turned, I came face to face with a tall, tanned, Greek godlike guy. Oh, hey Apollo. Gemma hastily wiped the finger full of icing she had been about to put in her mouth onto the tablecloth. Hey, he smiled. Congratulations. Thanks, I said. What are you doing here? I thought you graduated like two years ago? The Faculty of Engineering is doing a panel for some of the new engineers about career options, and they asked me to come speak, he explained. Then I saw you and thought I'd come say hey. Oh, well, hi, I said, wondering how it was possible for someone's eyes to look like literal liquid gold. Hi, he smiled. We looked at each other for a long moment. Brooklyn, Tyler was calling from a little ways through the crowd. Your grandma's here and she wants a photo. Okay, I called back, feeling jumpy. Well, um, bye, I said to Apollo. I'll text you later, he said. Have fun. I chose to ignore the knowing smirk that passed over Gemma's face as we made our way back to our families. My other two best friends, Bree and Lana, were there now. They hadn't been able to attend the ceremony because each graduate only got three tickets, but they had brought flowers and congratulations all the same. I posed for yet more photos, trying to soak in this moment of accomplishment 
and not ask myself the burning question that was corroding my insides. What next? I could worry about that tomorrow. For now, it didn't matter that I had no job. It didn't matter that my lease would be up in less than a month and I had no plans or financial means of finding a new place to live. It didn't matter that my boyfriend's hand on my waist was inexplicably pissing me off. All that mattered was this moment. Everything else would figure itself out. Wouldn't it? Thanks for listening to Confessions of a New Grad. If you want to find out what happens next, go ahead and click on the following episode. One through seven are out now. Confessions of a New Grad is written, narrated, and produced by me, Greta Craig. Our story editor is Rebecca Montgomery, and she created all of the amazing artwork for the project as well. You can follow the show on Instagram at New Grad Podcast. Special thanks to all the amazing musicians who allowed us to use their songs in this production. You can find the soundtrack in our show notes. You go to the movies to escape. And the call can help audiences. Nine seconds. To escape. People connect with him getting justice for the everyday person. This equalizer is much more personal. McCall had gotten addicted to unnecessary violence, and there are consequences. I can take anything I want. I still damage the odd fellow here and there, use some various utensils. When necessary. The Equalizer 3, in theater September 1st. You're listening to Confessions of a New Grad. This podcast is an ongoing story, so I'd recommend listening to the previous episodes before starting this one. Chapter 2. The Basement. It was probably a mistake to move in with my boyfriend. Six weeks after my happy graduation, I was crying in the attic of Tyler's parents' house. I looked out over the top of the stairs, wondering if Tyler would come up them and we would continue arguing, but he didn't. I clutched my phone like a baby clasps a soother, as though I expected it to ring and someone would come rescue me. It didn't make a sound. I tried to decide what to do, but couldn't. My mind felt scrambled. I didn't know how to make decisions right now, and I hadn't been able to make good ones for a while. I looked into the mirrored doors of the closet in the corner, unsurprised to see that I had raccoon eyes from the mascara I had cried off. The dark black clashed horribly with my skin, which was as colorless as the cloudy sky outside. Even my freckles had disappeared. How did I get here? I still can't explain how I ended up moving in with Tyler. I can tell you what happened, but I can't justify why I decided to live with him when I had no desire to do so. All I can say is that it kind of just happened. 
In the month leading up to my graduation, I had assumed that the question mark, which was my life, would just kind of answer itself. It sounds dumb, I know. And the closer it got to graduation day, the further I fell from having anything that resembled a plan. During my last year of school, when I had gone back for a year to get a teaching degree, because the English Lit degree I had obtained my bachelor's in wasn't exactly opening up doors, my dad had invited me to come live in Thailand with him for a few months after graduation while I figured things out. Moving back home wasn't exactly uncommon at that moment in my circle of friends. The difference was that all of my friends' parents lived in North or West Vancouver, while mine had been living in Singapore, where I had grown up, until recently relocating to Thailand. A little over a year ago, they had unexpectedly broken up, and my mom had moved back to Calgary to be close to my brothers and her family. We were technically from Calgary, but as I had never really lived there, I was always reluctant to call it home. What would I do in Thailand? I asked my dad, wanting him to just give me a purpose so badly. Well, why don't you write? He suggested. You've always wanted to have time to write a book. That was what I wanted. It was the only thing that I wanted. It was why teaching wasn't going so well. It wasn't that I disliked teaching. In fact, I felt guilty for not being more excited to be a teacher because it was objectively a pretty great job. It was just that I wanted more. Well, not more, because I didn't think that teaching wasn't enough. I had so much respect for the teachers I'd met and all that they did. It was more like I wanted something different, something that was right for me. I wanted to be a storyteller and telling brief little anecdotes to a group of teenagers who were essentially forced to listen to me wasn't enough. Going to Thailand could have been a dream. I mean, how many aspiring authors have the opportunity to do something like that? I knew I'd have to get a paying job after a few months and enter this real world that people kept sarcastically welcoming me to. But Thailand would be an opportunity to give plan A for my life, writing, a real shot before settling for plan B. So I decided I would do it. I would go to Thailand for four months, write my book, and then come back to Vancouver to get a teaching job while I tried to get it published. I convinced myself that it made more sense to be in North America during the publishing phase anyway, but the main reason I would be coming back was so that I could be in this city that I love, which was the closest thing to a home I'd ever had, and because of Tyler. I thought it was the perfect plan a way for me to try to make my dreams come true, but still have a grip on reality. But Tyler did not like it. Why can't you just write in Vancouver? He demanded. Because I don't have a home or any money here. Why don't you just get a job then? I could, but then it would take longer to write my book. If I go to Thailand, I can entirely focus on writing. I've told you that. I've been waiting to write a book for years. I just don't think it's fair for me to have to do long distance for four months so that you can party in Thailand. I won't be partying. I'll be writing a book. Four months isn't that long. If I want to finish my book in that time, I'm going to be writing nonstop. Why don't you just apply for jobs at the Vancouver School Board? I'm sure you could at least get a subbing gig. Because I want to be a writer, Tyler? I don't want to do long distance. Why are you being so selfish? We continued like that for months. Brooklyn, I know you love Tyler, my mom would say, when I would call her in tears, wondering what I should do. 
but you have to do what's right for you. I don't know what's right for me, though. I have to choose between my ambition and my boyfriend. I think you do know, she would say, softly. What? I would ask her. She wouldn't answer, because she liked to let me make my own choices, but I could tell what she was thinking, because deep down, I was thinking it too. I just wasn't ready to admit it yet. And so, the months leading up to my graduation dwindled into weeks. And I would tell my mom and dad that I was going to break up with Tyler, not because I wanted to, but because he was leaving me no choice. And then I would try to tell Tyler this, and he would tell me I was being selfish and convince me that I could have both, that I could stay in Vancouver and be with him and also write my book. And then it was two weeks before my lease was up, and I had not booked a flight to Thailand nor applied for a teaching job, and Tyler's parents were offering that we both come live in their basement for a while while he applied for jobs and I wrote. And I appreciated their kindness, but the thought of living in their basement made me want to cry. And then it was a week before my lease was up, and then it was five days. And then Tyler and I were packing up my things and putting them into his dad's truck. And I was ignoring the horrified looks on my parents' and brothers' faces as I told them what I had decided to do. And they were trying, diplomatically, to convince me to change my mind. And then I was lying there on Tyler's bed, which was propped on a 30-degree angle because he had been having digestive problems and this apparently helped, even though it meant that I spent my nights feeling like I was falling off the face of the earth. And then there I was, living with my boyfriend in his parents' basement, and Tyler was happy for about a week until he began to hate me because I could get a job and he couldn't get any kind of work at all. And I began to hate him because I had given up Thailand for him, and I felt trapped and uncomfortable in his house, and the little amount of savings I had was draining away. And then we started fighting all the time. And tonight had been the biggest fight of all, and I had gone up to the attic because I hadn't wanted his parents to hear us again, because even though we didn't scream or yell, they knew something was wrong. And now I was staring at my phone, wishing someone would call me and tell me what to do, because my life had gone to shit, and I didn't know how, if I was really so smart and confident, I had let this happen. But my phone was silent. No one called or texted. No one knew that something was wrong and no one was coming to save me. I took a deep breath because that's what you're supposed to do when you're freaking out, right? Who could I call? Mom, I thought instinctively. I hovered over her name in my contacts, but didn't press it. Even though being in Calgary made her close by my standards, she was still too far away to do anything for me. Well, I supposed that wasn't entirely true. Knowing her, she would probably jump on the next plane over, pick me up in a taxi, and take me to a hotel. But that would cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, And I didn't want her to waste her money on that. If I called her in the state I was in, though, I knew it was what she would do. So perhaps it would be better to wait until I had calmed down to let her know what was going on. My dad was less likely to make a hasty decision than my mom, but he was also in India on business right now. So the chances that he would pick up when I called were pretty slim. 
My brothers were both in Calgary too, working and going to school. Neither of them were close enough to get me out of this situation either. I needed a friend, one who could calmly tell me what to do until I regained the ability to make decisions for myself. Gemma, I thought. I scrolled through my contacts and pressed Gemma's name. To my surprise and relief, she answered within a few rings. Hey, Rumi, she sang happily into the phone. We still called each other Rumi, in spite of the fact that as of three weeks ago, We were no longer roommates. Hey, I began. What's wrong? She asked. It was insane how quickly she could read me. I'm coming. You're at Tyler's, right? Yeah, I'm coming. Don't worry. Gemma lived in Lions Bay, which was a minimum half-hour drive, so I just stared at the attic ceiling blankly until she texted me, saying she was outside. I stood up, hoping Tyler had joined his parents in watching their movie in the basement so that I could reach the front door without seeing any of them and pull an Irish goodbye. But as I began descending the stairs, I saw Tyler turn the corner below and come up them. Look, he began. I'm going to Gemma's, I announced before he could finish. That's probably a good idea, he said. I nodded. His body was still taking up the whole staircase, though. I inched past him, keeping my eyes on the steps. He made a noise, as if he was going to say something when I reached the bottom, but I was done talking to him. I walked swiftly to the front door, threw on my raincoat, and rushed across the cold, damp, cobblestone pathway away from the house. The street was difficult to make out through my tears and the twilight drizzle, but I could see a tall, slim, beautiful figure waiting for me a little way down the road. Gemma's enormous mane of curly brown hair was swept to one side, and she was wearing as was her custom, a blanket draped around her shoulders, like a shawl. Her arms opened wide as I approached her, and for a moment, I just held onto her and cried. What happened? she asked, stroking my hair. Can I tell you in the car? I just want to get out of here. She nodded, and we hurried into her mum's red minivan. Gemma waited for me to explain. I didn't. If you don't want to talk about it right now, that's totally okay, she said. I don't know what I want right now. That's fair, you're probably in shock. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I now have no job, no boyfriend, and as of tonight, I'm homeless. Gemma glanced at me from the driver's seat. Her expression was full of concern, but as her large baby blue eyes met my watery green ones, an inexplicable smile flickered across her face, and in the next moment, we were both laughing. I don't know why this is funny, I choked several minutes later. Me neither, I'm sorry for laughing. It feels better than crying about it. You'll probably be sad for a while, and that's totally normal, Gemma said bracingly. I definitely feel something, I mused, as I looked out the grey, rain-flecked window. It's just not sadness. What is it, then? Relief, maybe? I know I told you that everything was great between Tyler and I, but I actually really hated living there. Yeah, I knew that, she admitted, but I'm glad you figured it out sooner rather than later. How long were you living with him for? Not even three weeks. Right. Do I need to egg his house? 
No, I laughed. Jem, you know I appreciate the love, but you can't do that every time a guy makes me cry. Why not? She asked. It wasn't as though the last one didn't deserve it. I smiled, remembering what had happened. It had been back in second year, when I had been dating what I thought was the sweetest guy ever. His name was John, and we'd randomly made out at parties on and off since first year, but never actually spoken until third year when he'd finally gotten up the courage to ask me out. All of his friends had told me at one point or another throughout the years that John was really into me, but was painfully shy, so they were excited when we finally got together. We had a great time together. He would make me food and text me all the time, and was smart and funny and fun to be around. I took things slow with him because I told him that I didn't want to sleep with him unless I felt secure in the relationship. So he had done all the right things to make me feel secure. I never officially heard him call me his girlfriend, but I figured that since we were going on dates, texting and hanging out all the time, that we were a thing. This was a mistake. And I learned that lesson the hard way. Eventually, we slept together, which only made me like him more. And then things got weird. He became a little distant until one night while I was out at the pit, the local dive bar at UBC, I saw him on the dance floor, in spite of the fact that he had texted me saying he wouldn't be going out that night. Unperturbed, I made my way over to him to say hello, but then I saw that a slender girl with bright pink hair was hanging onto his arm. And then he pulled her into him and kissed her. Gemma, Lana, and Brie, who had been dancing with me, saw the whole thing. And Lana and Brie had to restrain Gemma from making her way over to John and the girl and punching him in the face. They had instead taken me home, but not before we saw John leaving with the girl with the bright pink hair. Gemma, Lana, and Brie snuggled up to me while I cried on my bed. They tried to make me feel better by telling me that I didn't deserve what had happened, that I would find someone better, etc. But in that moment, I felt pretty pathetic. I was hurt that he was hooking up with someone else, but also felt like I couldn't be mad at him because I now realized he'd never asked me to be his girlfriend. This made me feel stupid and crazy on top of everything else. You're neither stupid nor crazy, Gemma shouted, returning to her previous rage. You told him you weren't going to sleep with him unless things were exclusive, and he told you they were. You guys have been inseparable for like three months. Just because he didn't ask you to be his girlfriend, that doesn't mean that all that other stuff didn't happen or that you don't have a right to be upset. She's right, Brooklyn. You were way out of John's league anyway, Lana said. Let's make a midnight snack. That always makes me feel better. We have no food, Brie pointed out. What? That can't be true. It is. Remember earlier tonight when I told you guys we had to go grocery shopping? I wasn't kidding. But there wasn't enough time to get groceries and also stop at the liquor store, Gemma said. And it was pit night, so we couldn't very well not have liquor, could we? Exactly what you all said at the time, Bree shrugged. Which is fine, but we seriously have nothing in the house. Not even a packet of instant noodles. I've got eggs, Lana leapt up triumphantly. I'll go make them. 
She returned, looking devious, a moment later. So we could eat these eggs, she said, holding up the carton. Or maybe we could put them to better use. Oh, fabulous. Gemma scrambled off the bed. Give me ten. I can't wait to pelt them against John's bedroom window. No, no, no. Guys, I said, you can't egg his house. Why not? Gemma inquired. Because it's vandalism. Vandalism? This isn't Singapore, Brooklyn, Gemma scoffed. It's not like the police are going to cane us if we get caught. Okay, but still, you can't. He's such a douche. He doesn't even deserve to have good eggs wasted on him. These are probably rotten, actually, Bree chimed in, peering at the expiry date. Gemma scrutinized the carton. These are incredibly old. Are these the ones I told you to throw out three months ago, Lana? Bree asked. Probably, Lana said. Well, in that case, it'd be a waste not to take this opportunity, Bree grinned. I stared at her. Bree was the most reserved of my friends. I couldn't believe that she was seriously considering egging someone's house. Yes, it's fit, Gemma cried triumphantly, and she, Lana, and Bree skipped out of our front door. I yelled feebly after them to come back, but couldn't bring myself to actually get up and stop them. I still can't believe that you guys did that, I told Gemma now as we merged onto the highway. It was one of the most therapeutic moments of my life, Gemma said gleefully. I put all the rage I had towards every guy who had ever fucked any of us over into those rotten eggs. I was so worried that we'd get in trouble from the residents. I mean, his roommates didn't deserve to have their house egged. Yeah, but they loved it. Don't you remember how you tried to apologize when we bumped into them the next morning and they all just laughed and said, he deserved it. <laughs> yeah, it was really cold that night and the eggs froze onto the front of the house. The image of John chiseling away at frozen, rotten eggs brings me joy to this day. I smiled at her. It was strange how a night that had once been so painful was now a source of comfort. But anyway, Gemma said, just say the word if you want me to round up Bree and Lana for Revenge of the House Eggers Part 2. I grinned. I knew she was joking. At least, I was pretty sure she was. We were older now, and couldn't go around egging guys' houses anymore, but it made me feel better all the same. So, have you asked Apollo out yet? Tyler and I haven't even officially broken up, I laughed. Oh, her shoulders slumped. But good to know where you stand on that. Sorry, I just kind of assumed you guys broke up tonight. No, we just had this huge fight, and then I called you and left. Ah, she said. Silence passed over us again. So, do you want me to keep prying until you're ready to talk about it, or, like, distract you? She asked. Distract me, please. Gemma drummed her fingers on the steering wheel, as though deliberating something, and then burst out, I hooked up with Austin Larson two weeks ago. Who? You know, that douchey frat bro we're always seeing at parties talking about how he's going to create a revolutionary new dating app. Oh, wow, you? You hooked up with that guy? Please don't judge me, Brooklyn. You couldn't possibly be more disgusted with me than I am with myself. I'm not judging. He's hot. Gemma gave me a disdainful look. Looks aren't everything Brooklyn. Yeah, I said. I guess he's not really your type personality-wise. He's not my type at all. He's the antithesis of me. I laughed. 
Austin did represent a lot of the things that Gemma despised. In addition to being in a frat, he was notorious for hooking up with sorority girls and never calling them back. Gemma and I knew this because we had come face to face with several of his exes crying drunkenly in bathrooms at parties over the years. So how did this hookup even happen? Oh, it was that night at the copper tank after you, Lana, and Bree left. I was just feeling so overwhelmed about not knowing what the fuck I was doing with my life. And then you all left to go live happily ever after with your boyfriends. Trust me, I definitely wasn't living happily ever after. Well, I thought you were. Anyway, the people who were still there were kind of lame. So I went to go get my coat and Austin came over and said something along the lines of, Hey, Gemma. And the next thing I knew, I was hooking up with him on a top bunk in Kappa Sigma. Wait, he still lives in the frat house? I thought he graduated with us. Gemma rolled her eyes. Apparently, he's staying there for a few months until he can find an apartment. He kept going on about how cheap it was, as if he thought he'd scored some incredible bargain. And I was like, dude, it smells like feet and fried chicken. And there's another guy on the bunk below us listening to everything we do. I laughed. Been there. Yeah, in first year, but I've graduated Brooklyn. What's wrong with me? Nothing, Gemma. Calm down. It's not a big deal. And maybe we're judging him too soon. Just because he's in a frat, that doesn't mean he's not a nice guy. Oh, but he's such a bro. I was insanely thirsty, and he kept giving me Coke instead of water. Cocaine? Or like cans of Coke. Cans of Coke, but still. I had to go to one of those grimy communal washrooms they have and drink from the tap to keep from dying. And that's not all. He's a big John Mayer fan and put the song Why Georgia on repeat until morning. Oh my God. Why Georgia? The bloody thing's still stuck in my head. Seriously, Brooklyn, I'm concerned about myself. I don't know what I've been thinking lately. Don't be so hard on yourself. It was a one-time thing, and you never have to see him again. Gemma's hands clenched on the steering wheel. She glared out onto the rain-flecked windshield. It was a one-night thing, right? I asked. Oh, that's just it. It happened again this past weekend. What? Did he take the bus out to Lion's Bay to visit you? Gemma glowered at me. Yes, Brooklyn. I brought Austin Larson home to meet my parents and then we skipped past them to go hook up in my bedroom. Yeah, I figured you probably wouldn't want to bring him home. Oh, he's been texting me ever since that night. And I was on campus on Saturday, dropping a few art supplies off anyway, and... Well... Gemma trailed off, shaking her head in disgust. So how was it? I asked. Don't ask me that, Brooklyn. It was horrific enough living through it the first time. Oh, come on. If you really thought he was that bad, you wouldn't have ended up in the frat house with him two weekends in a row. Trust me, it won't be happening a third time, Gemma said emphatically. Her phone, which was in her cup holder, buzzed at that moment, and a text from a contact labeled NEVER AGAIN in all caps flashed across the screen. Never again? Is that Austin? I asked, snatching the phone up before she could stop me. The message said, I can't stop thinking about you. How's your week going? Aw, Jem, I think he likes you. Well, I don't like him, she said forcefully, snatching her phone out of my hand and throwing it onto the back seat. Even so, I thought I might have seen the faintest shadow of a smile flicker across her face. Thinking where we go to feel alright. I guess we used to know what it'd be like to never be alone. Thinking about it now, don't know where I've been. Driving all the time, doubt every dead end. Lighting up the dark, only.
Thanks for listening to Confessions of a New Grad. If you want to find out what happens next, go ahead and click on the following episode. One through seven are out now. Confessions of a New Grad is written, narrated, and produced by me, Greta Craig. Our story editor is Rebecca Montgomery, and she created all of the amazing artwork for the project as well. You can follow the show on Instagram at New Grad Podcast. Special thanks to all the amazing musicians who allowed us to use their songs in this production. You can find the soundtrack in our show notes. And that's this week's show. Please check for show notes for Confession of a New Grad at sonicsociety.org. Send us an email at sonicsociety at gmail.com or contact us through the Facebook groups or Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> it may be changed by the time this airs. It's really <laughs> true. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> Until we see you next week. Don't go taking any wooden nickels. I'm Jack Ward. And I'm David Alt. Wooden nickels? I mean, shouldn't that be raised for inflation? Plastic pounds sterling? Have a wonderful <laughs> Sunday, everyone. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> Feed so you don't miss a day of your favorite shows. Subscribe to Mutual Audio tonight. Good night.